I love Beetlejuice. Seriously, it's my favorite star. Excepting the obvious, of course. Skin cancer and the occasional worldwide blackout notwithstanding. And no, it's not because of the name. Well, not just because of it. I'll admit, that's how I first heard of it. Though I'm old enough for my first exposure to have been via Douglas Adams, rather than Michael Keaton. How would you react if I said that I'm not from Guildford after all, but from a small planet somewhere in the vicinity of Beetlejuice? I don't know. Why, do you think it's the sort of thing you're likely to say? And of course, I thought it was a joke. Indeed, when someone corrected me, I thought he was pulling my chain. But no, there is indeed a star named Beetlejuice. I'd like to say I fell in love then, knowing nothing else about it. But it took moving to clearer skies, and occasionally noticing the stars for the first time, to really begin the affair. If you are watching this video, then I assume you attended a planetarium performance as a child. And if you did, I'm sure that at some point you were encouraged to find the Big Dipper. I do get why. The Big Dipper, or the plow to my UK audience, is circumpolar, which means it's visible throughout the year in the Northern Hemisphere. And it has the happy bonus of the two stars at the front of the ladle pointing toward the North Star. But once I left the comforting pathways of the planetarium and attempted to relocate it in the real world, I found myself lost. I'm sure many of you have found the Big Dipper. But I never have, and I refuse to accept it as entirely my fault. For one thing, the Big Dipper is, well, big. Fully 25 degrees across, and far larger than it appears in many diagrams. For another, none of the stars that comprise it are particularly bright. Ursa Major, the constellation containing the Big Dipper, has none of the top 30 brightest stars in the sky. Now, compare Orion. All right, it isn't circumpolar, so you won't be seeing it all year, but you can certainly see it now, provided you're living anywhere but where I live, and also not on a polar expedition. Orion is a shockingly bright constellation, the only one in the night sky to contain two of its ten brightest stars. It is also an object of supreme geometric perfection, from the supernatural alignment of the belt and the curving elegance of the sword to the rainbow corners of its stark parallelogram. It has the feel of an artistic work, rather than an accident of position. On clear nights, the stars of his shield seem to blur together into a single brushstroke, like an illustration ready to leap off the page. And while it cannot point you to the pole star, following the line of the belt downward will take you to Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, while tracing it upward will take you to Aldebaran, the bull's great red eye. His two brightest stars, Betelgeuse and Rigel, point toward Castor and Pollux, the Gemini twins, while the stars at his shoulders point to another of the sky's brightest stars, Procyon. As a constellation, Orion almost goads us into granting it meaning, and many cultures have. To the Yongu people of Australia, the stars of the belt are three brothers in a canoe, imprisoned in the sky by the sun goddess for consuming forbidden fish. To the Lakota people of North America, Orion forms part of a grand constellation comprising the skeleton of a bison, with the belt its spine and the grand rectangle its ribs. The Polynesians, rather wonderfully, interpret it as a cat's cradle. But to the loose succession of civilizations commonly referred to as the West, Orion has always been a man, often a mighty warrior, raising his great club in defiance of all comers. To the Babylonians, he was the shepherd of heaven, fairly standard for cosmology crammed the brim with heavenly shepherds and sheep. To the Egyptians, he was a god, the herald of Sirius, whose first appearance presaged the flooding of the Nile. Some have speculated that Orion may have been Gilgamesh, who slew the great bull of heaven, now called Taurus, when Ishtar, the fickle goddess of love, sent it to savage his people after he spurned her advances. Orion does appear to challenge the bull from his perch above the Milky Way, as indeed he was drawn by Albrecht Dürer. But it is to the Greeks, of course, that we owe the name Orion. Though unusually for such a mythically fertile culture, aside from that name, they left us little else. For all his prominence both in the sky and mythic illusion, Orion the Hunter is a man with almost no story, and what little there is suggests that he, like many Greek heroes, 
was a bit of a scumbag. Like Beowulf, or indeed Gilgamesh, Orion falls neatly into a specific mythic archetype, the brawling giant and slayer of monsters. Though unlike Beowulf or Gilgamesh, for a man called the Hunter there is little evidence of what he actually hunted, though his shield is sometimes drawn as a lion's skin draped over his arm. His best-known story concerns his trip to the island of Chios, where, sloshed to the eyes, he tried to rape the daughter of the local king, who blinded him and sent him into exile. Wandering aimlessly and in pain, Orion eventually made his way to the farthest east, where Helios, the sun, restored his sight. Thus healed, Orion promptly returned to Chios, to seek the forgiveness of the woman he had wronged, his heart now heavy with the wisdom of his trials. Hell no! He just wanted to murder the king for blinding him, though thankfully the king survived by hiding underground. Happily, Orion was too stupid to avoid that old hero's bugbear, hubris, for long. After getting chummy with Artemis, the virgin goddess of the hunt, he boasted to her that he could kill any creature born of the earth unwise words in a world where the Earth is a sentient being. Naturally, Earth decided to test his hypothesis by raising a giant scorpion, which then killed him. Artemis, distraught, asked her father Zeus to place him in the stars, though never at the same time as the scorpion. Not keen for a rematch, huh? Constellations are coincidences. Tricks of the eye, as ephemeral as shapes and clouds. And, just as clouds gather and fade, so the constellations will, in astronomical timescales anyway, twist and writhe, their shapes sliding into newer, unrecognizable forms. Our earliest true human ancestors did not look up to our sky, nor will our descendants a hundred millennia distant. Constellations were long thought immortal and immutable. Today we know they are as transitory as the seasons. And yet even so, Orion is a special case. Its brightest stars are, by and large, not aligned by chance, but are in fact traveling in unison. The reason why can be seen at long exposure, rearing behind Orion like a dragon. The Orion clouds are titanic, graceful structures hundreds of light years across, comprising not just the eponymous Orion Nebula, which glows as part of the sword, but also the popular Horsehead Nebula probably the most over-photographed structure in the history of astronomy. Clouds such as these are hothouses out of which new generations of stars are born. Embryonic solar systems can be seen forming in the Orion Nebula as I speak. Stars are born in clusters, and, as the motion of the galaxy sweeps them up and carries them to their destinies, they stay locked in step for a time, like birds afraid to leave the nest. The stars of Orion are mostly believed to have formed in one such cluster, as little as 12 million years ago. Members of this flock include the three stars of Orion's belt, Mintaka, Alnitak, and Alnilam, the stars of Orion's sword, and the stars at his feet, Saif, and the monster star, Rigel. Betelgeuse is believed to have been born in the Orion Nebula before being knocked into a wild careen by a passing supernova. This also explains why so many of Orion's stars are bright. It is one of astronomy's great counterintuitions that the brighter a star is, not only the younger it is likely to be, but also the sooner it is likely to die. The stars emerging from the Orion clouds are young, and while many will go on to have long, stately lives like our own sun, others rushing out the gate are raging, fleeting giants, offering only the briefest of glimpses before supernovae cut short their truncated lives. The reasons for this, like stars themselves, are both complex and simple. A star is a battle between the force of gravity and the force of radiation. Gravity pushes down, energy from fusion pushes up. The more mass a star has, the more gravitational force pushes down, and the more energy is required to push back. The key is the mass-luminosity relation. For every increase in mass, the luminosity and the energy required to generate it increases to the power of 3.5. In other words, a star ten times the mass of the sun will not be ten times more luminous, but 5,000 times more. Against that, 
the additional fuel provided by the greater mass becomes irrelevant. Giant stars such as those in Orion are like children with progeria. If our matronly sun's ten billion year lifespan were reduced to the seventy-five years of a human life, then it would currently be pushing forty, while Sirius would be a child of seven, and the stars of Orion would be barely one month old, with most unlikely to live through their second month. Betelgeuse is the sad conclusion to this story. Just 8.5 million years old, or 23 days in this extended metaphor, it is already in advanced old age and preparing to die. On the plus side, though, when it goes, it's really going to go. Once familiar with Orion, it is impossible to miss Betelgeuse. Against the blazing white stars that make up Orion's body, Betelgeuse's smoldering red stands out almost literally like a sore thumb. Its homey, hearth-like glow belies the fact that it is roughly 700 light-years away. In terms of mere mass, however, Betelgeuse is not actually all that impressive. At 12 solar masses, it sits comfortably, if not confidently, above the 8 solar mass ledge separating giant stars from titches like our sun, which are too small to go nova when they die and instead cast off their outer layers like a prima donna after a bad performance, leaving behind a quiet white dwarf. When Betelgeuse blows, its supernova will briefly outshine the entire galaxy, and its corpse will be a neutron star, a hyperdense lump of magnetic fury that releases as much energy in one second as our sun will in a million years. Nevertheless, Betelgeuse is still less than half the mass of those stars august enough to become black holes when they die. But mass isn't where Betelgeuse stakes its claim. It may not be very heavy, but it is big. Very, very, very big. Although it is difficult to say exactly where Betelgeuse begins or ends, measurements of its diameter average roughly 900 times that of the sun. If our sun were the size of a tennis ball, then Betelgeuse would be larger than Epcot's spaceship Earth. Even at its distance, Betelgeuse takes up more of the sky than any star other than the sun, and is one of the few stars besides the sun whose disk we have directly imaged. Placed in the center of our solar system, Betelgeuse's swollen, seething extremities would almost touch the orbit of Jupiter. Of the stars visible to the naked eye, only Antares, the jewel of Orion's bane, the Scorpion, likely rivals Betelgeuse in size. Okay, I can hear the furious tapping of keys from the comments section already. Before we go on, let me be absolutely clear. There is no right way to pronounce Betelgeuse. If someone you respect happens to pronounce it in a certain way, that is a prerogative, not a prescription. I call the star Betelgeuse because that pronunciation best adheres to my rule of thumb for pronouncing star names. Preserve as much as possible of the original language without sacrificing clarity to the English speaker's ear. This likely makes me a nation of one in pronouncing Fulmalhut. Seriously, Fomalo? Where do they even get that? But in truth, the reason there is no right way to pronounce Betelgeuse is because Betelgeuse is not a real word in the first place. I have a hypothesis regarding star names. You can tell how long we've cared about a star from the language its name is in. The stars we've cared about since, well, forever, are Greek, like Sirius, Antares, or Procyon. If we only started caring about them in the Middle Ages, then they're Arabic, like Altair, Deneb, Vega, or Aldebaran. If it took the invention of the telescope for us to care about them, then they're Latin, like Proxima, Mira, or Bellatrix. And if only modern science cares about them, well, then they're gibberish. Betelgeuse, at least nominally, belongs to the Arabic camp. Indeed, most of it is perfectly decodable. Al-Jawza, the giant, is the old Arabic name for Orion. The problem lies in the first syllable. No one knows what it means. It's fair to say that the earliest Latin copyists were not Arabic scholars, and as a result, something got lost in the translation. In the 19th century, a theory emerged that Bet al-Jawza was originally Ibt al-Jawza, armpit of Orion, though more recent scholars have argued that the error in fact derived from a mistranscription of the Arabic Y as B, and Betelgeuse was originally Yad al-Jawza, or Hand of Orion. Oddly, 
Ptolemy's original description was shoulder of Orion. So yes, when Roy said, Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. He may have been referring to Betelgeuse. Of course, Orion's other shoulder is Bellatrix, which means female warrior. A far more fitting grave for an attack ship, so that's where he was in my mind. Anywho, the point is, given that there is no established origin for the word Betelgeuse, there really isn't an established pronunciation for the word either. About the only prescription I can give is that, since we know that the name was derived from Al Jauza, you probably shouldn't pronounce the G hard. Brian Cox. Most interesting star, I think. The, the star that could be shocking in our sky is this one, Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse. As for myself, I choose Betel because B E T E L, a mild stimulant used in Eastern Asia, is and always has been pronounced Betel in English. I choose Juice rather than Jews, because I don't want to sound anti-Semitic. It's really that simple. I wish the rest of this video was going to be. Betelgeuse is a red supergiant. Most people know that stars, even our sun, will eventually swell into great red furnaces as they exhaust the fuel in their cores and begin to fuse in their outer layers. But nothing that awaits us in our future can even hope to compare to what is happening to Betelgeuse. If you want an idea of what our sun will look like in about 5 billion years, follow the belt up to Aldebaran. Red supergiants are actually quite rare. This is not only because stars of their mass rarely form, but because they last only moments in cosmic time. The chaotic nature of star death means that a star can dance across the color spectrum in its final days, from inflamed red back to yellow as they cast off their outer hydrogen layers, becoming so-called wolf rayet stars, and even rejuvenating back to blue before they explode. As the progenitor star for 1987a, the closest supernova to Earth in over 400 years, did in the Large Magellanic Cloud 33 years ago. For Betelgeuse, this may have already happened. In the first century BC, the Chinese historian Sima Qian described Betelgeuse as yellow, though since Ptolemy described Sirius as red, and Homer said the sky was bronze, it's best not to rely on historical color descriptors. I keep calling Betelgeuse a star, and it is, but that word is inadequate to describe the monstrous creature it has become. Our sun, which, naturally, is the standard by which we usually measure others of its kind, is a tidy thing. Its innards encompass within a smooth sphere, any leakage confined to the occasional coronal mass ejection. Despite having a core of fusing hydrogen denser than gold, the sun averages out about the density of water. Betelgeuse's average density is a million times less, or about as dense as the atmosphere of Triton, even though it too is still fusing in its inner shells. Betelgeuse might best be described as a diffuse mist of searing plasma, though some have described it as a superhot vacuum. It is debatable where the star ends and the rest of outer space begins. As giant stars age, they begin to pulsate, their surfaces expanding and contracting like exhausted lungs. No one is entirely sure why, though it may in part be the result of fusion interacting with the star's vastly expanded volume. This means that Betelgeuse varies in brightness over the course of about 400 days, though the duration and intensity of the variations is not fixed. However, Betelgeuse displays other variations which cannot be explained by pulsation alone. A possible alternate source is convection. All stars produce convection cells, but in our sun these cells are so tiny relative to its surface that astronomers call them granules, essentially bubbles in a boiling pot. But Betelgeuse's surface, if it could be called that, is roiled by a very small number of gigantic convection cells, cells so big they can distend its disk even in our telescopes. These cells propel vast quantities of Betelgeuse into interstellar space as much as a solar mass every 10,000 years. Red supergiants are so huge, and yet so diffuse, that the gravity at their outer edges is barely a 30,000th that of Earth. This causes them to lose grip on their outer layers, which, blown outward by winds, flutter back down like tossed bedsheets, or get blasted into space. These discarded layers can be seen in the infrared as great exhalations of dust, burst out at irregular intervals into the surrounding environment, 
creating a vast nebula extending as far as 400 AU, or about twice the width of our known solar system, from the star's surface. Dust clouds blocking our line of sight are thought to be a third actor in Betelgeuse's variability. These bursts are thought to be the result of radiation from within Betelgeuse heating surrounding dust, which acts like the lid of a pot, holding back the heat until the star blows its top. Shock waves from these bursts are thought to create hot spots in Betelgeuse's upper atmosphere linked to its north and south poles. Betelgeuse's variation was first definitively noted by John Herschel in 1846, during the same Cape of Good Hope expedition in which he named the moons of Saturn. Like a true scientist, he then completely forgot about it and only rediscovered it while overviewing his notes a few years later. He may not have been the first, however. Stories among Australian Aboriginal tribes describe Betelgeuse as waxing and waning, suggesting they were aware of its variability, which is visible to the naked eye. This variability makes Betelgeuse extremely difficult to study. Everything astronomers know about the universe is deciphered from light. Light allows them to measure how large a star is, how far away it is, and even what it's made of. If that light is inconsistent, then it affects everything deduced from it. Measurements of Betelgeuse's distance have varied over the years by as much as a factor of two, while measurements of its diameter have an uncertainty of roughly 25%. Unfortunately, Gaia, ESA's current astrometric powerhouse, is tuned to catch faint stars, so has little time for monsters like Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is always raging, always flickering, and always darkening. And one day, it will explode. But when? Soon, say astronomers. But astronomers don't reckon time the same way you do. When they say soon, they usually mean within a hundred thousand years. Human beings are not capable of intuitively understanding astronomical timescales. Documentaries throw words like million and billion around as if we were capable of grasping them. We are not. As I noted earlier, Betelgeuse's 8.5 million year life is, in astronomical terms, a flicker in the night. But when Betelgeuse was born, our ancestors were still in trees. If I grant Betelgeuse the boon I previously granted our own son, and map its meager 8.5 million years onto the 75 years of a human life, then human civilization only occurred in its last month. And Betelgeuse was barely a month in the life of the sun. It takes a monumental egocentricity to assume that the grand finale of a star that has seen the progenitors of our species come and go would occur within your own fleeting existence. And yet, it just might happen. Or rather, it just might have already happened, since the event of Betelgeuse's implosion would take 700 years to reach our eyes. Thanks to neutrino detectors, astronomers will have a few hours' warning of any coming supernova. But as to what to expect in the weeks, months, or years prior to the event, no one can say for certain. Simply put, no one has ever seen a star go supernova. Oh sure, supernovae are recorded all the time, but novae are called novae because they are just that. New. They emerge from nothing and out of nowhere. The stars that made them lost to time. Unless, like the 1987 supernova, they can be traced with precovery images. The explosion of the star Betelgeuse would be an event unique in the history of our species, let alone our civilization. We simply don't know what to look for. That's why, when discussing matters interstellar, it's always a risk to interpret language in human terms. When, on January 20th, 2020, Edward F. Guinan and Richard J. Wasatonic of Villanova University described the current dimming of Betelgeuse as unprecedented, they of course meant unprecedented since accurate records began in about 1830. Granted, that is still an astonishing time scale, given that Betelgeuse tends to pulse at 18-month intervals. But astronomers have noted longer variation periods within the chaos of Betelgeuse's atmosphere, and it may be that Betelgeuse is simply introducing humanity to another one. Guinan first alerted the world to this event in December of last year, noting in an astronomical telegram that Betelgeuse had fallen from its usual magnitude of 0 0.5 to 1.12, a dimming not seen during 50 years of observation. On January 20th, they noted in another telegram that Betelgeuse had dimmed to magnitude 1.5, dropping from the 10th 
to the 25th brightest star in the sky. Is the culprit a dust cloud in Betelgeuse's upper atmosphere? A coincidence of different variation cycles? Or something unique? Perhaps terminal? No one knows yet. Determining one cause of dimming in a red supergiant among the forest of possibilities is daunting at the best of times, and often impossible. Though, as of right now, consensus seems to be coalescing around dust cloud. In late February, Guinan reported that Betelgeuse's dimming had stalled, which suggests it might be nearing the midpoint of its cycle. If so, then this fit of the vapors may be quickly forgotten. If not, we may yet bear witness to something no human has ever seen. If Betelgeuse is indeed about to die, I, for one, will mourn. As I said, Betelgeuse is my favorite star, and I don't say that lightly. I have often been comforted by its unmistakable presence on cold winter nights. Make no mistake, a Betelgeuse supernova would be a massive cultural loss. A star that has been part of our mythic and historical consciousness since we first began telling stories will, for one glorious year, outshine the moon, granting us a truly awesome vision of the universe, and then be gone. For the first time, a nova will not have added a new star to our lives, but taken one away.